Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Philip W. Dunn, Program Manager with U.S. Black Chambers, Inc. On behalf of our President, Ron Busby, our board and our staff, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to this special recording of our U.S. Black Chambers webinar on Black American businesses' role in closing the digital divide. Now, this webinar is presented in conjunction with our very special partner, CTIA. CTIA represents the U.S. wireless communications industry, everyone from carriers and equipment manufacturers to to mobile app developers and content creators. They bring together a dynamic group of companies that enable consumers to lead a 21st century connected life. Now we thank them for their tremendous support and their partnership with USBC. And back here at USBC, we work closely with partners like CTIA to develop quality programming that's designed to help our members uh, thrive and succeed. Now, with that said, our partner CTIA, along with USBC, we've noted that Black American communities are outsized users of wireless connectivity. Now, this continues to be vastly expanded to provide wired light speeds during the transition to fifth generation networks. Now, at the same time, issues like the lack of broadband adoption and digital literacy still loom within communities of color. Black businesses as key innovators within our communities, we have a role to play in helping to close the digital divide. We also have this role to play while also ma maximizing our business's potential. Now, within this challenge exist opportunities to expand our digital literacy and increase representation through entrepreneurship. This panel that we feature today will feature voices from the wireless industry discussing these issues from their company's perspectives. Now, the companies represented today are the very best. Uh, they are AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon. And our panelists are none other than Kima dennis Morial, the Director of Public Affairs at AT&T, Michelle Persaud, Chief Counsel of Strategic Alliances and External Affairs at T-Mobile, and Michelle Kober, Director of External Affairs at Verizon. Now, I'll ask each panelist to introduce themselves and share a little bit about their backgrounds and their experience with their respective companies. And I'll start first with Michelle from Verizon. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever and whenever you're watching this. Uh, my name is Michelle Kober. I am Director of External Affairs at Verizon, as Phil just mentioned. And I've been with Verizon for going on four years now. I started as a lawyer with the company in the Federal Regulatory Group. And now I have moved over to External Affairs where we work very hard on public policy issues such as the digital divide, the, the topic of the conversation today. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to an engaging and um, informative discussion of this topic. And thank you, Michelle. And we'll go next to Michelle from T-Mobile. Hi, good, uh, good day, everyone. Um, I am Michelle Prasad at T-Mobile. Um, I've been with T-Mobile for 14 years now. Um, I spent 12 and a half years on the federal legislative affairs uh, team uh, prior to shifting over to our strategic, to, to co-lead our uh, strategic alliances and external affairs department, which was newly created in July of last year. Um, this has been an exciting run for me uh, over at T-Mobile. Before joining T-Mobile, I was on the Hill with the House Judiciary Committee under Chairman John Conyers, the late great chairman. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of my profile has been with uh, respect to um, civil rights, social justice, and I trust. Um, I'm an attorney. Uh, le legislative affairs has been a big part of my being and life at T-Mobile, but external affairs is, is new. It's, it's what um, I consider to be a baby of mine. And I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to this conversation of the work that we do um, in this world, in this area is, is critical to um, not just my day-to-day -day, um, as an employee of T-Mobile, but the in the world in, in which we thrive and, and, and live and exist and work and operate. So I'm definitely looking forward to the conversation on how we can best work together to uh, close this divide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And we will turn next to Kima Dennis Morial. Thanks, Phil. So I am Kima Dennis Morial, Director of Public Affairs for the Multicultural Segment within external and legislative affairs at at and I've been here a little bit, a little over a year. And prior to that, I was on Capitol Hill working for Congressman Cedric Richmond, who is now uh, in the administration. So in my role, I manage relationships and engagements with the national third party stakeholders, such as the US Black Chambers, 
national civil rights organizations, trade organizations, and advocacy groups. And you know, standing for equality is one of our core values here at AT and T. Um, and you know, we know that communities of color face inequities and disparities across many areas. And so we've been working with other companies to bring about change. And so we're looking forward to this discussion, talking about the digital divide. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to this discussion um, um, with uh, the, my counterparts. Thank you so much, Kim, uh, Michelle, and Michelle. I, I really do appreciate your very uh, experience and, and your varied perspectives. And I wanna jump right into uh, the panel discussion because there's so much that we have to, to talk about and so much ground to cover. Uh, one of those things that we have to talk about, and all of you have you know, some form of experience with uh, uh, legislation and, and how that impacts business. Uh, one of the things that has taken place recently is the federal infrastructure package that was just recently passed. Uh, as you know, the Senate passed infrastructure bill uh, that contains $65 billion in broadband funding. Now, nearly $42.5 billion of this is dedicated to deploying broadband infrastructure. Now, we know that the process of getting money out the door and getting broadband into people's homes, that could take months, if not years. And, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, until that happens, until we see this through, what are, what are some of your company's, you know, initiatives? What, what are your companies doing to address the millions of Americans who are presently experiencing the digital divide every single day? And in no certain order, please feel free to jump in and answer this question. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, answer. So here at AT&T, uh, we believe that broadband connectivity is essential. You know, we know that it fuels jobs, education, civic engagement, and economic growth, things we desperately need more of due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's why AT&T made a commitment to invest $2 billion over the next three years to help bridge the digital divide. And this uh, renewed commitment combines AT&T's low cost broadband service offerings with charitable contributions. And it builds on our contribution of nearly $1 billion over the last three years towards helping the nation's most vulnerable communities. So we want broadband solutions that are affordable, accessible, and sustainable. So for that, we are providing help in three ways. In the immediate term, we are uh, providing um, help with affordability through the Temporary Emergency Broadband Benefit Program or EBB, under which low income households may receive a discount off the broadband service and certain connected device devices and um, participating providers can receive reimbursement for these discounts. Another way is through uh, continuing what we have here called AT&T Access, and it's our low cost broadband offering. It was introduced five years ago, and it provides qualifying households wireline, wireline internet service at discounted rates. In the short to medium term, we are helping with accessibility by launching AT&T Connected Learning, which includes a digital learning platform from Warner Media, And we're also launching 20 AT&T Connected Learning Centers in underserved neighborhoods. I'll talk about that a little later. And so we expect to increase our fiber footprint to about two and a half million customer locations uh, before the end of 2021. And we will also continue to build out our 5G networks. Currently, uh, we cover 251 million people nationwide. And then finally, in the longer, for, you know, longer term, uh, through plan on helping through network planning and build out combined with comprehensive policy changes, which um, we'll touch upon a, a little bit a little later. Uh, thank you for that, Kima. And, and it's interesting to hear about accessibility, affordability, uh, and the many different ways that you plan to help the consumers in the marketplace. That is definitely going to go a long way uh, in helping to bridge the digital divide. And I, I know that there's a, a lot of, of content that that is, you know, being, uh, you know, put out around this particular topic. But I wonder if, uh, you know, if, if we kind of move forward uh, in the discussion and talk about closing the digital divide. And 
uh, basically we want to make sure that every American has access to affordable broadband. And it's a perennial goal of state, local, and, and federal uh, policymakers. Uh, Congress even appears to be very close to passing uh, or was very close to passing the infrastructure bill and, and went forward with it. Uh, where do you think there are still opportunities for policymakers and industries uh, to do more? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, fully closing the digital divide is, is a problem only uh, that the country can only solve by government and uh, industry working together. So this is why we are advocating for policymakers to, to pass significant policy reform that can ensure all Americans are connected. And there are a couple of ways uh, that we believe that this can be done. Uh, first, to prioritize unserved and then unserved Americans so that we prevent the waste of taxpayer dollars by targeting government broadband funding to those most in need using accurate maps and discouraging policies that will result in overbuild. Next, we uh, believe that we should allow for a mix of technologies that will meet the needs of consumers. Another way is to modernize the FCC's low income lifeline, lifeline program to put the consumer in the center, similar to other government assistance programs like SNAP, where beneficiaries are able to receive benefits electronically and make digital payments with a debit card. And then um, finally, um, making broadband funding support sustainable through direct appropriations. High-speed internet access for all Americans to fully, uh, is necessary for all Americans to participate fully in society. And we support a bar bipartisan approach to smart policies that will close this divide. Oh, thank you for that. And I like the fact that, you know, you're supporting targeting unserved and underserved, right? So that this way we're not, you know, just taking a, a shotgun approach, uh, you know, where we really need to be laser focused in on, on the communities that need uh, the digital divide to close. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for those responses. And, and I want to keep us moving forward. And I know that, you know, this topic is about digital divide in small businesses. And when I think about the digital divide as it relates to small businesses, it, it can differ in many ways. And uh, when I think about some of the problems that you know, our community faces, whether it's uh, having representation in the technology and telecommunication space, or uh, whether it's uh, having the funding needed in order to access uh, certain technologies or even the digital literacy required uh, to move forward. Uh, I wonder if you can tell me, I wonder if the panelists can tell me, is it related to lack of access to the internet? or just lack of an online presence, or is it both? Uh, Phil, I think um, I'll jump in here. I think it's, it's a combination of both. And I think one new issue that has come up um, is that now there's a lot of lack of actual people to do work. There's a labor shortage right now. And so if you are a business and you can't get uh, workers in the door, you need to be able to use all of your digital tools in order to get your, uh, maximize your business's potential. Um, so we, we're talking about having your website up to date. We're talking about being able to uh, use your website to make purchases or display your, your products. And we're also talking about now digitizing some of your day-to-day um, -day operations that normally a person would be doing. And now you actually need to be online with a fully operational system uh, so that you can have some of that work automated. Um, and so Verizon has made a major commitments to small businesses over the past year in order to help bolster that online presence uh, we know that funding has been an issue, so we've entered into some partnerships to try to get funding into the hands of small businesses and uh, most recently have started an accelerator program um, to help small businesses have the tools, the education, and the network that they need in order to maximize it, what we're, we've been moving into a more digital world most recently. No, thanks for that response. And, and I, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, basically the title of this panel and today's panel description 
uh, talks about the role that small businesses have in helping to close the, the digital divide. And so, you know, I wonder, specifically Black-owned businesses, small businesses in general, what is their role and, and how can that role be beneficial to their businesses? I think I saw the other Michelle was about to say something. I didn't want to jump in. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I'm happy to say something. Um, I, you know, this is something that, you know, uh, how, how, how the role that, that Black businesses, that small businesses um, generally across the board um, have in, in helping close the digital divide is really, it's a matter of, um, you know, and I'm, I have to caveat this by saying, I'm not a fan of blaming anybody that is a victim. Those that have been historically and systemically left, kept behind in the dark um, due to programs, due to uh, structures in place. I'm not a fan of saying that, you know, their lack of adoption is, is the problem and, and, and encouraging adoption to uh, groups of segments of people who do not normally have the access or know or are aware of the fact that there are um, these tools or things available that they could use to leverage their business um, and, and to help you know close this this divide. I, I definitely uh, you know with that caveat in mind, I have to say that you know it's it's up to the industry and government. Uh, somebody said that earlier to work hand in hand to ensure that you know hey look we know that there are these options available. Um, let's get that information to you and provide you with these resources so that you can take advantage of them. And this kind of goes into the previous question as well. Um, I know that at T-Mobile, we, in, in February of this year, we launched a program called Magenta Edge. We also launched a T-Mobile Accelerator program, but Magenta Edge in particular is, um, it's, it's intended and geared to help small businesses by providing technical resources, business grants, and educational programming for entrepreneurs. Um, and it does have a foundational focus on black owned small businesses as they have, um, as I just mentioned, been dis disproportionately impacted during the, well, during the COVID-19 crisis, they all came to light and um, which was exacerbated uh, this longstanding systemic lack of access. Um, the purpose of the Magenta Edge program is not only to highlight black business, but to provide a free online library of business resources to small black owned businesses. Um, you know, it's anything from marketing to tax. There are eight foundational themes that are covered um, with free business development advice, business grants, and um, other, other tools and resources that entrepreneurs will have access to. Um, it's, it's a, in a nutshell, it's essentially a resource, resource center um, that it has been sponsored by, by T-Mobile um, that you get access to our, you know, cutting edge, um, you know, advice and expertise and, and resources uh, to help guide through that. The process. I think that that is, you know, a start. Um, it's not not even close to, you know, a, a bridge, but it's 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 a start in the right direction. At how I agree. No, no, no. And thanks for saying that because I I do think that you know you talked about awareness earlier in uh, small businesses, the black business community. Uh, we have to understand that, that there is a divide. And that we can work with our providers, we can work with the T-Mobiles, the AT&Ts, and the Verizons uh, to make them aware of the divide as well, and to engage in some of the programs like Magenta Edge, uh, like the Black Business Accelerator, and I know that the work that AT&T is doing, uh, in order to take advantage of those programs, in order to push forward with closing the divide. So I'm glad that you brought that up, uh, because you know it, it speaks to the broad you know, number of resources that are coming about. And, and we saw last year where many companies made commitments to help uh, communities that were being underserved or uh, ignored or neglected. And so I'm glad to hear that each of your respective brands, your companies are stepping up to uh, meet the challenge. And I didn't want to cut anyone off just in case they were about to say uh, anything uh, else. Uh, Michelle, were you about to add in or Kim? Yes, I just, the only thing I wanted to add is that, you know, we know that broadband is a part of the foundation that enables these small businesses to grow, to scale, you know, and so by scaling, you know, they're creating more jobs. And so we just, um, you know, we know that broadband's help broadband helps to bring them countless benefits through sophisticated data and analytics, increased data security, 
seamless automation and expanded e-commerce. So, you know, that's basically, you know, having access or, or fully utilizing all of the resources that broadband provides will enable, you know, them to help the community at large. Interestingly enough, uh, Kima in Texas, uh, there was a survey taken of black owned businesses about eight years ago. And I suspect that some of the, the data is still the same. And uh, it basically highlighted the fact that black owned businesses felt that they needed the technical training uh, in order to help move their businesses forward. About 10 to 15% of the businesses highlighted this as a major need. And so it's really great to see major corporations are, are stepping up to close that gap. Because if we do sell up that gap, we increase the uh, amount of hiring, we become job creators uh, in a sense uh, where we haven't had the uh, opportunity to do so before. So uh, thank you all for, for those perspectives. And I wanna keep us on time and, and, and move us forward. And, and uh, one of the things I think about and, uh, Michelle from Verizon alluded to it is that the pandemic did place, uh, you know, many societal inequities uh, in sharp relief, and, and it sort of highlighted the the difficulties that we we had over the last eighteen months. And among the hardest hit were the tens of millions of, of uh, kindergarten through twelfth grade students who who needed to quickly transition to online learning. I know my children had to quickly transition to it, and, and uh, so did I. You know, I felt like I was a student as well. So let's think about this for a moment. We're, for students living in homes without broadband, uh, particularly acute problems for uh, minority and low-income families, uh, this transition was very tough uh, for them to make. So as, as the new school year begins or has begun, what lessons have your companies learned, and how are they taking steps to make sure that students stay connected on and off campus? I'd like to take that, um, just to, if that's okay with, with folks. Um, you know, I know that at T-Mobile, at uh, one thing that we saw was, was just how critical high-speed internet access is for living in the 21st century. And through this pandemic, um, you know, we have approximately 17 million school-aged children that do not have access to high-speed internet at home and 95 percent of k-12 through school teachers are using at least one digital tool in the classroom 75 percent use three or more so you know this is something that impacted more than 55 million students across the country that forced them out of a physical classroom as, as, as you said you know to 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 kind of drive this point home we, there was a mckinsey study that came out that said that um, black and Hispanic students are more likely, continue to be, excuse me, more likely to remain remote even now and are less likely to have access to the prerequisites of learning, devices, internet access, et cetera. Um, so T-Mobile launched a program. Actually, we launched this program um, in September of 2020. It was devised in October of 2019. So it took us a year to get it off the ground, but it was, it came into being and we actually kind of, the reason why it took a little bit longer was because of the pandemic. Um, we had to shift and, and, and do some tweaks to the program to make it more you know, robust. Um, it's called Project 10 Million and it's our $10.7 billion landmark initiative um, that would pro provide free and heavily subsidized um, connectivity and mobile devices to millions of underserved, um, you know, overlooked student households over the course of five years. Um, you know, there, there are partnerships that we engage in with school districts and, uh, you know, Project 10 million will offer free wireless hotspots or free or heavily su uh, subsidized high-speed data, access to affordable laptops and tablets um, to underserved uh, community student households. Um, through 2020, last year, we connected more than two and a half million students across the US. Our goal is to connect 10 million students at, at a minimum and beyond. I mean, we're not going to stop there. Um, initially, the project was project 1 million. So, you know, obviously we exceeded that quickly. Um, in, in Texas, uh, you mentioned Texas earlier, we partnered with uh, Operation Connectivity to connect 171,000 students across the state. Um, it's, it's a statewide initiative for those that don't know um, to deliver internet connectivity and devices to Texas school districts for online learning. Um, in LA, in Los Angeles, California, we partnered with Angelino Connect Connectivity Trust, which actually is a great organization. Um, it's, it's, it's an initiative to help deliver internet access to vulnerable young people, including ex students experiencing homelessness, those in foster care and youth with disabilities. Um, you know, th there's, there's no excuse in, in today's modern age to not have 
connectivity and access to, to an education, um, especially in a first world country like, like the US. You know, T-Mobile also has a program called Empower Ed, Empower Ed 2.0. Um, it was modeled after Connect Ed, which was uh, part of the uh, President Obama's administration and back in 2013, and you know, it provides Empower Ed, the T-Mobile version, provides wireless devices and service plans to eligible schools and their students. So it offers you know affordable mobile data plans, you know, twenty dollars a month um, for for I think if it's two gigs, two, two gigabytes um, unlimited, and you know, content filtering to help prevent access to inappropriate content. Obviously, that's important. So you know, things like that, and then also the emergen emergency connectivity fund, which is something that we we uh, participate in, but you know. Uh, as, as the other carriers do as well. So, you know, that's, that's, there's a lot that we can do and a lot more that we can do. You know, we're gonna continue to keep working to make sure that this is a problem that doesn't persist. Uh, very, very uh, solid programs there to help uh, make sure that the pipeline uh, to entrepreneurship is open. Uh, the pipeline to uh, the workforce is open as Michelle uh, mentioned earlier that there is a shortage now. And so uh, having that technology in hand Having those resources in hand uh, is going to help to enhance education uh, for those K through 12 uh, students. And, and Michelle, looks like you're about to contribute as well. Yeah, I just wanted to mention some of the uh, Verizon initiatives because we too um, understood how important and critical it was to it, to shift immediately um, and to provide assistance. And it was just such an urgent time last year. Uh, when everyone just was sent home and, and children were left without any access to education. Um, so we at Verizon, we partnered with some school districts uh, nationwide and were able to get discounted connectivity to 36 million students in 38 states and including the District of Columbia um, so that they could get online. And we made uh, digital tools and, and educational resources available online for educators across the country, because this was this was a new world, and we're trying to figure out how to change your music class from in person to online. Well, you need tools to be able to do that, and so there were some toolkits that we made uh, immediately available. And then we also uh, the Verizon Innovative Learning Program has been something that's been in existence for many years, but we expanded it uh, to more middle schools, and for the first time, uh, introduced the program into high schools. So um, there, were, there were other initiatives that we took also, I'm, I'm being mindful of time here, but I think that um, companies such as Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T, we all understood the urgency and how critical it was for digital tools to be included um, and, and education just was so critical. And we're continuing those activities now, even though children are back in school in many places, the need is still there. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for that additional info on, on the work that Verizon is doing. I know it's an incredibly important to ensure that, you know, we extend, you know, these resources along the pipeline, right? So starting as early as, as uh, elementary school, building the capabilities in high school so that by the time they graduate, many of these folks can either, you know, start businesses or, or continue to support businesses, support their family businesses, or go immediately into the workforce. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for, for those comments. And, and again, being mindful uh, of time, I'm, I'm going to keep us, keep us moving. And, and, you know, when I think about uh, education, I think about literacy and I think about digital literacy, which is something that we've all come to, to learn uh, since we've been on uh, the, the internet. And I, I think primarily about broadband access and it's, it's, it isn't only the, the connectivity issue that Americans face, uh, but many individuals with access to affordable or reliable broadband, they choose not to subscribe or, or they lack the digital skills needed to fully unlock the power of the Internet. And I think about someone, you know, uh, who's elderly, maybe, or, or uh, someone that just doesn't have enough time uh, to invest in, in a affordable broadband. Now, beyond providing accessible affordable broadband, what are some ways to ensure that broadband subscribers have the digital skills and tools that they need in order to effectively use uh, this important infrastructure? Yes, I'll, I'll take that. Um, you know, in addition to, as, as you mentioned, in addition to accessibility and affordability, there's, you know, this third leg 
of the broadband stool, you know, that is, it's a little like less well understood and it's, you know, often overlooked um, and it's digital literacy and engagement, or, you know, sometimes we refer to it as adoption. And so here at ATT, what we've just, what we've, um, we have a goal of uh, providing 1 million K through 12 students with the technology or skills needed to succeed by 2020. So how we're doing that is over the next uh, year, we're launching 20 at and connected learning centers, and they're gonna be uh, targeted in traditionally underserved neighborhood. So they'll provide high-speed uh, at and fiber internet, Wi-Fi, laptops, employee tutoring and mentoring and learning content. And so this is in conjunction, or we're, we're doing this together with uh, the uh, PLA Public Library Association. And we will offer a collection of digital literacy courses to help families navigate um, remote learning and build their digital skills. So courses will be available online for everyone and also offered in person at these centers, as well as public libraries. Uh, something that we're doing over here at Verizon, uh, we are partnering with the National 4-H Council to provide digital skills training to adults in rural communities. And there's a specific focus on people of color. And it's called the 4-H Tech Changemakers Program. And we are working with nine HBCUs, which is uh, something that is near and dear to my heart as an HBCU graduate. And we are hoping to provide training to 15,000 adults. And so, you know, to tie this in with, with your audience, Phil, speaking about small businesses, this training is so necessary, not only to apply for jobs, to do research, to understand what jobs and opportunities may be available to you. Um, when your employees come in the door, they need to be able to you know, do training, which may be online or you know, conduct business online. So if we get this pipeline started early where we get people able to use the internet, understanding what it can do for them, it can only enhance how businesses are able to operate. No, I agree. And, and both very, you know, critical initiatives that uh, both of your companies are, are pushing forward, because I, I think you've managed to, to leverage an existing audience that craves this information, and they're able to immediately turn these into uh, immediate benefits. So, uh, and, and we've seen that a lot of folks have switched careers, you know, once they've gained a, a better understanding of technology, once they gained a better understanding of how to use uh, broadband infrastructure. So this is something that's critically important and the metrics that you're, you're measuring uh, are gonna be very critical to move us along as well. So uh, I wonder if there's anything else to add before we yeah. move forward on that. If it's, if it's okay, uh, you know, just to kind of highlight some of the, the work that T-Mobile has, has done in this area as well. You know, we uh, partnered with, in, back in October of 2019 with six civil rights, social justice, multicultural leadership organizations nationally known across the, you know, across the country um, to come up with a plan of action for T-Mobile to kind of have a roadmap for um, change and diversity and inclusion to our commitment to it. Um, one of those facets uh, kind of manifested this year. Uh, we've invested with, along with these six, with the input and advice and counsel of these six organizations, We've invested in digital literary, literacy programs um, and partnering with local community organizations also to help overcome these inequities um, that with, with these organizations uh, that are making progress in the space. Uh, you know, we view that possessing necessary technical skills is one of the major obstacles for certain positions. And you know, we, we, the goal with these partnerships with these, these digital literacy programs is to help provide career training um, and placement for thousands of these under underrepresented candidates um, to take on five roles in 5G network uh, as technicians. Um, so black technicians we, we found were particularly underrepresented 
um, making up just 10% of the telecom network infrastructure field. So we have a five-year partnership with the Learning Alliance Corporation um, that we started at the beginning of 2021. And our initial seed funding supports uh, 50 candidates through 2021 and um, 39 are graduating, 29 of whom have already are already employed. Um, and we have additional candidates set to graduate by December 2021, and they will be placed um, with T-Mobile or with our partners um, through, through, this, through this program. So it's something that's, it's, again, it's a five-year partnership. So 2021 is almost over. It's coming to an end quickly. Um, and then it will continue and, and hope, we hope to grow it, it as we continue through the next five years. Very in, incredibly important is uh, increasing the amount of representation uh, in the workforce. And, and I commend you all on the work that you're doing there. All of you uh, seem to be doing a great job at, at executing on reaching out to uh, local civic organizations and helping to expand digital literacy and, and the footprint there. I wonder if you can tell us, uh, particularly our business owners, and many of our business owners are still, uh, in, in some cases, pen and paper uh, business owners, right? So, uh, you know, they're still kind of doing things the what I like to call the 2G, 3G way and, and not so much the 5G way. Uh, what are some of the areas of opportunity for small businesses to become more digital uh, in the work that they do? I mentioned a few of them earlier, Phil, and I apologize if I stole some of the thunder for this question, but um, we, we see it now all the time. I mean, we've gone into restaurants uh, safely, of course, during the pandemic. And, you know, there's contact free ordering now where you just order, uh, you, you scan the QR code with your phone, the menu pops up and then you order that way. Um, there, there are opportunities there for businesses where they can, you know, make their products online where traditionally they would only be a brick and mortar location in the store. If you can't have people come into your store, then you have to immediately figure out a way to pivot and move your business online. So there, the, the opportunities of creating your space online really uh, depend on where you are right now as a business. Are you automated? Do you have an online presence? Are you marketing? Are you using the tools that are available on social media and other places? to make sure that your business is seen and that you are generating traffic. Um, and we've seen a lot of that movement over the past year and um, the, the need, and, and it's really mandatory in a lot of cases for businesses to move online. And so uh, how do you do it? Well, one thing you need is money. <laughs> so uh, Verizon has been helping small businesses with grants so that they can do what, what makes sense for their business. And also with coaching, um, because what may be helpful for one business may not be helpful for another business. So if you have some specific information to help your business, your industry, um, that's also something that Verizon has been offering. Um, and then with these accelerator programs, again, there are many, many resources that are online that can be tailored and, and used specifically for businesses to make sure that they can bolster and improve their digital presence. I like that. And, and thanks for sharing that and re, you know, uh, making sure that you underscore that because I've been to businesses where, you know, some of them were able to adapt and they were able to take advantage of, of things like online ordering or, uh, you know, reservations or, you know, things of that sort in order to help manage through the pandemic. And then we also experienced businesses that uh, could not adapt. And so it sounds like you're uh, mitigating that as well through uh, coaching, mentoring, uh, the accelerator programs that uh, you're putting forward. So definitely glad to hear about that. Now, I know that we are uh, running, you know, right up against time. And so I want to make sure that I get everything covered. Uh, and I want to turn our attention to supplier diversity. This is something that's very important uh, to us at USBC. And when I think about the telecommunications industry, uh, you all invest billions of dollars each year uh, to deploy, maintain, and, and upgrade communications networks. And, and one of the things that we advocate for is that Black-owned businesses are included in the supply chain. Uh, tell us, uh, each of you, how your companies are working to elevate Black businesses, not just as end users, but also throughout your supply chains. Well, so I'll start. 
So, you know, the, the statistics that we see, you know, with black owned businesses closures right now are very worrying. And so that's made AT&T's commitment to supporting diverse suppliers more urgent than ever because, you know, black entrepreneurs have so much to offer and we, you know, we don't want their entrepreneurship to go to waste. So in support of these small minority owned and uh, women owned businesses affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, at and supplier diversity worked with regional diverse business organizations to provide grants covering fees for diverse supplier certification, which we know is a necessary step that businesses must take to work with corporations and other businesses seeking diversity in their supplier relationships. Uh, last year, you know, we spent $3.1 billion with black owned suppliers, which actually surpassed our 3 billion two year commitment to drive impactful and meaningful change with uh, black suppliers in the United States. So in total, AT&T has invested 200 billion with businesses and enterprises owned by minorities, women, service, disabled veterans, LGBTQ+, and people with uh, disabilities in the last 52 years. So, you know, given its, its, you know, its impact, we've been uh, recognized as one of the best in class and ranked number four as a top company for supplier diversity by Diversity Inc. just this year. So our, you know, another aspect is um, strategic outreach, which involves interviewing prospective suppliers at regional and nation, national supplier diversity events and sharing important information and criteria about doing business with AT&T. So we work with um, several diversity business organizations for targeted supplier identification, including national certification organizations, uh, chambers of commerce, business associations, educational um, institutions, and government agencies. So we're, we're constantly seeking new and innovative ways to deliver more value to our customers while strengthening uh, uh, the communities where we do business. I think I muted myself by mistake, but uh, thank you so much for, for sharing that, Kimo, because, you know, when I think about uh, what black owned businesses need. Obviously it is grant funding, uh, it is certification, and it is the knowledge of how to do business with uh, many major American corporations. So obviously what may work at AT&T uh, could work across other industries as well. And, and so I'm glad to hear, and to hear that $3.1 billion figure uh, is also uh, great to hear as well. And, and so I, I know that again, we're, we're running uh, sort of short on time, and, and I want to sort of close us out, if that's okay. Uh, and I'm thinking about uh, how diverse uh, we're becoming as a country, and I know that the latest uh, census figures were released, and we're starting to see more diversity form in the United States. So uh, your companies are also becoming more diverse, and your customer bases are becoming more uh, diverse. So can you all tell us uh, more about the role that diversity plays for your companies as major employers, customers of suppliers and, and sellers of broadband services. And, and we can start with, with T-Mobile. Um, sure, thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, you know, uh, T-Mobile uh, at diversity, equity and inclusion are integral. They have been and they continue to be integral to our mission. Um, it's deeply rooted in our culture of belonging and has always been at the center of everything that we do. Um, back in October of 2019, we took our efforts uh, to ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion to the next level, um, both within the walls of our company and in externally to the, into the communities that we serve. We signed a, an agreement that I kind of alluded to before with a coalition of six national civil rights and social justice advocacy organizations or multicultural leadership organizations, Black, Brown, and Asian, um, in which we committed to a robust framework for deepening our DEI footprint. And together, as a unit, the, the, the seven of us uh, came together to create a very detailed roadmap to doing so, both inside, again, the walls of this company and externally in the community. Um, this agreement, I, I want to note, was signed by all seven parties, um, including T-Mobile, and I represented T-Mobile during those negotiations, and was filed with the FCC and the DOJ, so it is a legally binding agreement, and it went into effect immediately upon the closing of our merger with uh, Sprint 
on April 1st of 2020. So it's been in effect for, and we've been executing on it on the 54 commitments that T-Mobile has made um, since April 1st of last year. Um, it outlines just in a quick nutshell, our plans to create initiatives to improve diversity in the areas of corporate governance, workforce recruitment and retention, procurement and entrepreneurship, wireless services, including 5G wireless services for low income consumers and philanthropic and community investment. Um, that's $25 million dedicated to philanthropic and community investment alone. Um, you know, the wireless services piece of it, uh, that's, that's rolled into our $40 billion spend that's going towards deployment in rural and specifically rural and urban areas um, across the country to make sure the coverage is, is you know, taken, taken very seriously and, and prioritized. It's already begun. Um, there are commitments and co corporate governance that focus on promoting more diverse and inclusive business practices, um, commitments, on, commitments on workforce recruitment and retention to increase the workforce development pipeline. Um, there are commitments in procurement and entrepreneurship to enhance our supplier diversity program um, and uh, commitments in wireless services that, um, as I mentioned before, to make sure that they're, they're not left behind in, in the speeds department, but they're going to have access to 5G as well. Um, and commitments in philanthropic and community investment, the, the, again, the $25 million goes towards that. You know, we recognize that 2020 um, in particular was an exceptionally tough year for black and brown communities, um, especially um, and 2021 hasn't been much different or much better, not that we expected it would be, but, you know, um, we're still aware of it. And with everything else happening, you know, this pandemic disproportionately in fact affected and impacted African-American Black-owned businesses. You know, we lost 41% of Black-owned businesses last year. You know, as Black, the data is, is there. Um, Pew did a study, you know, as Black businesses fail, unemployment increases. Um, we, we just can't afford that. And, and T-Mobile recognizes that, you know, this need to focus on developing Black-owned businesses um, that are recession and pandemic proof is, is a critical um, priority um, for this country as a whole. Um, and, you know, with, with my, my, my team, we are charged with the community investment and philanthropic piece of the, uh, what we've called now the equity and action plan agreement with these six organizations. And um, that's where we partner with various community groups and community outreach, outreach programs um, at, at the, you know, advice and counsel of our um, external diversity and inclusion council, I'm saying a lot of acronyms, that we created under this plan. So, you know, we've got a lot of work to do and we've only got five years to do it, but we actually, you know, we're, we're it's not going to stop at five years. We can't. We're, we're on our, we're on a roll and we're going to continue that momentum going forward. Um, so it's something that has, has begun a huge um, movement um, into, in, within the company that goes with our uncarrier brand and our uncarrier culture that we want to um, make sure um, continues to um, press forward. No, and, and thank you for sharing both the, the short and the long-term vision there, because I think it's important to see the immediate work that's being done, uh, listing out the commitments, making known those commitments, partnering with objective organizations to make sure that uh, you all reach your goals, uh, those short-term goals, and then extend that uh, beyond that as well. So thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing that. Uh, I wonder if we can go with Verizon uh, next on this one. Sure, um, there is so much on this topic that there's no way that I could cover it in the, the small amount of time that we have remaining, but diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that is and has always been very important to Verizon. So I would encourage people to look at our website. Um, we have very transparent about our efforts to advance diversity both in the workforce and outside of in the communities that we serve. Um, Verizon recognizes that we are not only um, a telecommunications provider or wireless service provider, we are a member of the community. And doing that means that we have corporate social responsibility um, goals and also uh, principles that we set out and, and, and um, want to make sure that we achieve. Um, so one of those that would be important to your audience is the supplier diversity figures. Um, and, and in 2020 alone, we made a commitment to, we spent over $5 billion with diverse suppliers. 
um, because we understand that that is a very important part of being a corporate citizen. It's, it's not just spending money with uh, the majority, but we need to spread the wealth, so to speak, and engage diverse suppliers. Um, and internally, as a Black woman working in corporate America, I can say that I've been very proud of Verizon's response to the murder of George Floyd last year and all of the internal initiatives that came after that. Um, we were seen, we were heard, and there were so many programs and so many initiatives to make sure that, that we understood as Black employees at the company that we were valued and that we mattered. Um, and I think that as someone in corporate America, and this may be a little bit of a personal statement here, but we all needed that last summer and we needed it moving forward. Um, and so I was very proud of the work that Verizon has done and very proud of the many, many initiatives that they launched and, and further bolstered after last year's racial reckoning. So we will continue those efforts. And um, I look forward to seeing the work of, of our counterparts as well, because you know some companies do things that are great ideas. And then we can also play off of each other's work it, because the larger goal is to make society better. So um, I'm glad to see that T-Mobile and AT&T are also undertaking efforts in the DEI department. Uh, thank you so much for that, Michelle. And uh, also I wanna add to that because uh, when we take a look back at 2020, it really you know, cracked open a lot of the feelings that many of the black American community were feeling uh, who work in corporate America. And, and I've a 20 year corporate American vet uh, working in corporate America. So I know that oftentimes, uh, you know, there was some disconnect in the African American experience and what goes on in corporate America. So to hear that Verizon uh, specifically addressed uh, the emotions, the feelings, and the injustice uh, during that time uh, is equally as important as the amount of work that you put into uh, the dollars and supporting black owned businesses, diverse uh, suppliers as well. So I'm so glad to hear that that message was put out and, uh, and I'm glad to hear that that's going to continue as well. So thank you, thank you so much for contributing that. And Kimma, I wonder if you can close us out uh, with your thoughts yes. on this last question. Yes, thank you. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just uh, be brief, but you know, like I mentioned, I've only been here or at at and for a little over, a, you know, a year. And I was so, you know, glad to see how at at and inclusion is embedded in everything that the company does. Um, you know, we em emphasize diversity and inclusion in all our business planning processes, including our global supply chain. You know, we, advocate for diverse business inclusion and direct contracting and subcontracting with our prime suppliers. Um, you know, we, we institute a, instituted a preferred supplier program that will assess a supplier based on criteria supporting the diversity of their supply chain and employee base, as well as sustainability efforts. And these suppliers will have preferential access to AT&T opportunities. Um, you know, we're, we're also continuously working to improve our um, diversity of talent across the company because we, we recognize that there's always more work to be done. You know, so our goal is to empower the workforce by providing pathways to technology and media careers. And if you, um, if you go to our uh, website, um, our diversity and inclusion website, one of at and core values is to stand for equality. So we have zero tolerance for racism, xenophobia, or any other form of discrimination. And we uh, strongly support local and global initiatives, including policy changes that will advance equity uh, and, and justice. And so from our board of directors to frontline workers across, you know, across the, the globe, we seek talented people who represent a mix of backgrounds, you know, and identities and experiences. Um, and then just to, to finish, uh, to, to, to close, I'll um, mention uh, a coalition that we've joined, which is the 110 Coalition. And it's a group of corporations pledging collectively to 
hire 1 million Black Americans over the next 10 years. And in 2020, more than 55% of open positions and 56% of promotions were filled by diverse candidates. So, you know, diverse businesses and employees add value to our company with their innovation and fresh ideas. And so, you know, we know that um, diversity and, and inclusion must be central to how we do business. So, um, you know, it, it's not new for us at all. We've been doing this for a long time and, you know, we know there's more work to do and we're, we're committed to doing so and we will um, continue um, to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, you know, information. Um, Kimmy. One quick observation, just because, yes. you know, it's, it's, I think it, it's, it's important to recognize, you know, you've got three black women here representing leaders, representing the three national carriers on this particular issue. We're leaders internally in our companies and we're all saying the same thing. You know, it's, it's, it's actually, it's a huge priority for us. And I just wanted to point that out because, you know, this is something that shows that, that our companies are and our industry is taking it seriously. You know, it's not, it's no longer being swept under the rug, you know, not saying that it was before, but the fact that you have that here now, I think shows that. No, and I appreciate you, Michelle, for, for underscoring that, because I, I think it does speak to uh, where we were 20, 30 years ago and, and to where we are today. And, and I think by having three uh, intelligent black women uh, representing these very strong brands, uh, is a testament that we won't be going back to uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, so I'm so glad to see that you all represented uh, these brands today. And, and uh, I'm so very glad that, that you all shared so much about your respective companies. And, and uh, Kima, if I, if I could just, just kind of touch on the fact that, you know, 55, 56% uh, filling those vacancies, filling those promotions, that's a heck of a challenge to, to fill, uh, especially when you're looking for talent in every segment, in every area. Uh, so I'm, I'm so definitely glad and, and, and proud to hear all the contributions that your companies are leading and then all the initiatives that you all are leading as well. Uh, it speaks to our partnership with CTIA uh, in representing companies that seek to push forward diversity and inclusion. And so we're definitely very appreciative. And so uh, with that, uh, I am going to close us out and I want to thank you all. I'm going to uh, just share quickly a screen and I'm going to excuse our panelists for today. Thank you, ladies, for representing uh, Michelle Colbert of Verizon, Michelle Prasad of AT&T, Kimma dennis Morial of AT&T, Michelle Prasad of T-Mobile, Kimma dennis Morial of AT&T. Uh, thank you all. Now I want to share just a few words about uh, the USBC upcoming Buy Black Conference, which is coming up in October. Uh, we have a very, very exciting conference that we're putting on display uh, starting October 13th through the 15th. In this conference, you can visit our website at buyblackconference.com in order to register to attend. We have tons of amazing speakers. We have some entertainment. We have some amazing content that we will be sharing with our member businesses, our sponsors, and our partners. USBC very much wants you all to be a part of this amazing uh, 2021 conference. Now, I should mention that this is a hybrid in-person and virtual conference. So we will have uh, 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 some folks that will be attending in person, about 150 people. So make sure that you register to attend if you want to attend in person. And then uh, the remainder will be presented virtually. And, and many of the folks uh, that will be attending virtually uh, want to make sure that we share, that we will be sharing as much content uh, with you all as possible so that you can also receive the value uh, that those folks received uh, who attended in person. So uh, again, uh, I want to get us closed out. And on behalf of our president, Ron Busby, our board and our staff, I want to thank our panelists uh, for attending and providing such valuable wisdom and, and information today. Kim Dennis Morial, Director of Public Affairs of AT&T. Uh, Michelle Prasad, Chief Counsel of Strategic Alliances and External Affairs at T-Mobile and Michelle Colbert, Director of External Affairs at Verizon. Each panelist brought with them valuable experience, uh, valuable information on behalf of their brands. And also want to thank CTIA uh, for their partnership to the USBC. And so with that, I wanna close us out. And I also want to 
uh, make sure that you all uh, follow USBC webinars uh, in order to register for events like these and to also uh, take advantage of other opportunities that we have when it comes to training. And then also look for opportunities that uh, come from our partners and our sponsors as well. So thank you all. Have a great day and we'll see you back here at the USBC.